Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you to talk about uh, vegetable IPM. We've got fruit in the title too. I only have a few fruit problem slides, but I'll be glad to you know take questions about fruit, of course. And um, here's our little agenda for today. So I wanted to divide the presentation into three parts. We'll look at some insects um, and environmental causes of plant problems, questions, then a break. Then we'll come back and do diseases and more questions, another break. And then for the final section, I'll um, throw up some scenarios, some case studies, if you will, questions from real clients, and um, we'll, we'll try to diagnose the problems that they presented. And then I've got some live samples um, that I will share with folks. So really looking forward to this day. Just a reminder that UME has some very good gardening resources on all topics. We cover vegetables and fruits. In addition to the web pages, we've got a really great blog and I'd encourage you to check it out, Marilyn Grows and um, you can follow us. There's also a Spanish language blog um, from two of our professors on campus that we're closely integrated with. We have lots of videos, social media, and of course, Ask Extension. You can submit questions 24 seven, include up to three photos. And so I'd really encourage folks to take advantage of that. If you're a master gardener, please share that with your clientele. And I would just, mentioned that um, to be able to pull up all of the UME resources, whether it's a web page or a blog post or a YouTube video in one search, it's really useful to simply type into your browser the topic you're, you're interested in, followed by UMD extension. So that's just a little pro tip from HGIC. Okay, um, so climate change is obviously uh, very important. It's impacting all aspects of our lives, including the vegetable garden. So the uh, urban heat island effect has been you know, exacerbated with climate change and that's causing night temperatures to increase uh, more rapidly than daytime temperatures, which is leading to problems really with flowering and fruiting and a number of crops. And that's happening out in farm fields as well. You know, crops are maturing more quickly. It's more easily to get sunburned crops, especially if we lose our leaf cover. Increasing CO2 levels in the atmosphere is actually favoring weeds over our preferred plants. And um, we know that because of uh, warmer temperatures, increasing rainfall, we um, are gonna see you know, effects in terms of diseases and insects and, and probably not in a good way. So for example, um, we can use shade cloth as a way to um, address some of the issues around rising temperatures. Shade cloths can reduce temperatures around plants. And this has been uh, researched and trialed extensively um, with uh, warm season crops like tomato and peppers for commercial growers. And an example of a pest that, um, you know, because of increasing temperatures, we can see certain insect populations reproducing more rapidly. And some of these pests like the white flies in this photo can overwinter more easily. So these are just some things to think about. I'd like to summarize integrated pest management um, for us this morning. And we'll use these different principles or main points that, that um, underlie IPM as guideposts throughout the presentation. And so number one, we've got to give our plants what they need. And we need to continue continuously try to improve our soils. And if we do those two things, our plants will not become immune to problems, of course, but they will be able to outgrow problems 
and withstand problems and still produce um, healthy, you know, tissues and, and fruits for us. Today we'll touch on um, some of the major pests and diseases, and that's really important, obviously, to know. There are so many different, uh, you know, disease organisms, insects in the environment. Most of them, of course, are benign or helpful. A very small percentage are going to be. One of the things um, we, as extension folks and volunteers, we um, really try to impress upon folks the importance of looking closely at vegetable plants during the growing season. We've got to get out there. It's really good to do it at least once a day, look at the leaf tops, the undersides, the stems, and that way we can pick up uh, pest problems early. So accurately identifying problems, um, then using all kinds of you know, best practices to prevent and manage those problems. And we'll cover a bunch of those best practices today. And integrated pest management can include pesticides. Uh, with the Grow It Eat It program, we decided early on to focus entirely on organic pesticides if people were gonna use pesticides. And we'll talk some about that as well. So I know not everybody on the Zoom today is a master gardener, but I think these tips will uh, should resonate with everybody. So how do we go about you know, diagnosing problems and how do we help other people who have problems uh, find you know, the reasons for the problems and solutions? Well, number one, not to jump to conclusions. A lot of people will see an insect on a plant and if they see any kind of injury to that plant, they assume that that insect and that injury go together and that's not necessarily the case. So we try to slow ourselves down, not jump to conclusions as to what may have caused the problem. We want to ask ourselves or our clients a lot of questions, you know, about when did this problem first start? Um, you know, where on the plant was it noticed and how is it progressing? We want to use some good resources at our disposal, diagnostic keys, web pages, um, you know, from land grant universities, especially ours, uh, to arrive at the most likely causes of the problem. And very importantly, we're trying to avoid the problem next time. Oftentimes, when we're faced with a problem, it may be too late to really do much about it. Whatever insect caused the injury is long gone. And so we need to think about what can we do to prevent it next year. Developing reasonable expectations is really important. We'll talk a little bit more about that today. What I'd like to say to folks is no matter how experienced you are as a vegetable gardener, um, some years you'll have fabulous success with a subset of all the crops that you grow. The majority of, of your crops will grow well <laughs> Hopefully, there'll be some that will have significant problems, typically. And so some things we can't predict, but I think the, the important thing to keep in mind is that these are biological systems. And so we have to understand there will be some insect feeding, there will be some disease um, you know, presence in different crops. And we just wanna minimize the, the levels of injury. We wanna prevent problems, but we wanna accept the fact that we're not gonna be producing perfect fruits on every plant, every season. So distinguishing major and minor um, pest is so important or problems is really important. So here are two examples. Um, and maybe uh, folks recognize the, the symptom here on the tomato fruit, we might see the same symptoms on pepper, eggplant, squashes. And um, of course, these are stink bugs. And on the right, this caterpillar is the yellow striped army worm. I think for most gardeners and growers in Maryland, stink bugs are a fact of life. I don't know many people that don't have at least some stink bugs feeding in their gardens every year. So this is a pest we want to really pay attention to. Unfortunately, it's not one we can do a lot about um, because they're very hard to kill with pesticides. They're hard to hand pick. Um, 
And so I think most gardeners accept a certain level of injury. Luckily, those um, the that injured part of the fruit right under the skin where the bugs stick their mouth parts in and suck out cell contents, that can be sliced away pretty easily. So it's a superficial injury. On the right though, this is pretty significant. The, this tomato is, is lost. And so the yellow striped army worm is not a pest everybody's gonna see. I see it pretty much every other year or so, or you know, out of 10 years, I may see it half the time. It does not overwinter in Maryland. Now, the five insect pests we're gonna focus on in this first section all will overwinter in and around our gardens. This caterpillar flies in from as close by as maybe Kentucky or so. That may be its most northern overwintering spot. But for me, it can be significant. I have to try to see if I can find uh, the eggs on the plants and I end up accepting a certain amount of damage. So, you know, pest populations vary by location. They vary by year. And we just have to recognize that. Um, and an example would be the big fall armyworm invasion of a good part of the Eastern United States last year. Some of you may have seen it in your own yards. They were, you know, um, feeding on turf and um, it, it was really quite, quite something. So that was, um, may have been driven to some degree by climate change, but it was um, quite, quite interesting. And that does happen every once in a while. That's why they're called army worms. They can show up in huge numbers. All right, so we'll look at, uh, as I mentioned, five insect pests. I wanted to really narrow it so we could get into some more um, detail on some of these pests and really think about um, you know, how, to, how to look at <clears throat> The, uh, the pests, their biology, and ways to prevent and manage them. So I think one of the most important things we can do as gardeners is to plant a wide variety of flowering crops, especially those plants that produce small flowers, which are great for um, our, a lot of our predators and parasitoids. Um, a lot of predators as adults need nectar to feed on. So, we have a lot of good information on our website about this. So we're not only trying to attract pollinators to our garden, but also the natural enemies that will help to control pest populations. So just a couple of examples, um, you know, predator on the left, a two spotted stink bug. And on the right, something I think um, a lot of people are probably familiar with are the very tiny, um, parasitoid wasps. In this case, it's the braconid, that's the genus, and um, they will parasitize hornworms. And so a lot of folks see these white, you know, little, um, what look like eggs on the outside of hornworms and assume that they are eggs, they're cocoons. And see at the bottom here is a um, close up of those uh, cocoons and you can see the tops have been chewed off very evenly and neatly by the adults who are now emerging. So a lot of little um, wasp immatures have been feeding inside the hornworm. It's a great example of biological control. And here's a, another one that um, is really important to think about and that is aphids that arrive, especially in the spring, they can show up on a lot of different plants. There are many different species. In this case, it's a, a black bean aphid on a rhubarb leaf. But I want you to look really closely at this photo because what you might notice is all these black aphids um, aren't black and they don't all look the same. And we can also pick up a little critter here in the upper right, and that's the um, adult wasp um, that has been active parasitizing this aphid colony. And how do we know this has been happening? Because we see a lot of the aphids look very plump. They've, they've become tan in color. They've lost their normal shape. Um, and, and so there, they, there have been um, the, the immatures of this wasp parasitoid feeding inside the aphid. 
and killing it. And then they will emerge. There'll be a little hole on the back of these mummies. And um, so the message is we don't have to get too excited about aphids oftentimes. Um, and that's because predators and parasitoids will come in and help keep their uh, numbers down. All right, so our first uh, major pest is cucumber beetle. They're actually two completely separate species, although they, they do the same kinds of things to our plants. There's the spotted cucumber beetle and the striped cucumber beetle. They do overwinter in and around our gardens. There are multiple generations. This is one of the most difficult pests for commercial growers and gardeners to deal with because it um, is difficult to hand pick. It's very difficult to find and um, dispatch um, of the egg masses. They're usually laid at the soil line and people don't see them. And um, the, this, the, both of these species can transmit diseases, which makes them pretty significant. And they feed on all plant parts. So they're gonna be uh, feeding on all, oops, sorry, all parts, all uh, members of the uh, cucumber family. So it's very easy when we're out in the garden to um, misidentify insects because many of them have similar characteristics. So I just wanted to show you um, two insects, the three-lined potato beetle and the pigweed flea beetle that are sometimes misidentified as striped cucumber beetles. And you can kind of, you know, understand how that, that could happen. So cucumber beetles will feed on all uh, parts of the plant. You, you get um, leaves that begin to look very tattered um, as the feeding continues. The beetles will feed on fruits, flower petals, and some of the things we can do to deal with this pest um, are to control it early in the season. And we'll, we'll be talking a lot about row covers today. And I have a few slides that describe row covers in more detail. So actually covering the plants with row cover will exclude this pest and, and others. That's really important. Um, a lot of commercial growers spray their cucurbit transplants that are going out to the field with an insecticide before they're planted to give them protection because the beetle feeding early in the season is what we're really trying to prevent, um, especially because that often can then lead to a bacterial wilt disease, which we'll talk about. So protection early in the season, that's the key. And another little trick is, um, to plant uh, short season crops like cucumber and squash, you know, those that can be planted all the way through the end of July, really, plant them a couple of times. So a plant that will mature in, you know, 50 to 60 days, we can get multiple crops during the growing season. And, and I know not everybody wants to delay their planting time, but since we know all these insect pests we're covering today, including the cucumber beetle, will overwinter in and around our garden. They emerge based on temperatures in the spring. And when the adults, in this case, emerge, they're looking for host plants to feed on. Now, these pests, unfortunately, striped and spotted cucumber beetles have a wide host range. So they can find weeds that will do just as well um, as cucumber plants. But if your garden is relatively weed free, if you delay your planting a few weeks, then the emerging adults will disperse when they cannot find their host plants. And you can actually avoid quite a bit of feeding injury that way, but it means delaying your season. Okay, so here's that magnificent stuff uh, that's done really so much for organic growers and gardeners to prevent and manage pest problems. It's this gauzy spun bonded polyester material. It is um, fossil fuel based, which is a negative. Um, it can be reused, um, although the lighter weight row covers that transmit the most light are the thinnest, and so they're the easiest 
um, to tear, but if you take good care of them, you can reuse them. They need to be held down to the ground to keep insects from getting under. And um, of course, with this family, squash, cucumber, that requires cross-pollination, we're gonna need to remove this cover when plants begin to flower. Um, and, and everybody always asks, what if the pest is already under the cover? That's a problem. And I've done that, I've trapped insect pests, and then you, you're basically protecting them and giving them free reign of your plants. So that is, of course, a possibility. I want to introduce something else uh, that's becoming more widely available, and that's this insect netting material that is, um, it's a fine mesh. The advantage over row cover is that it does not increase the ambient temperature underneath. Row covers can make it a little too warm for our crops in the middle of the summer. So these um, <clears throat> insect netting materials are, I think, going to become much more popular, readily available. They do cost more than row covers, but they can last for a number of seasons. And um, uh, it's going to be another great tool for us. And here's an example of this netting being used down uh, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, their small farms uh, demonstration farm. Uh, they were growing callaloo in a high tunnel, and they had the beds netted beautifully with this insect netting material. And it was to exclude this one particular um, insect, pigweed flea beetle, uh, and Callaloo is in the amaranth family. And so this is one of the major um, pest insects. So Steph, I think I'm gonna um, stop sharing and uh, we're gonna, well, let me just leave this up for a second. So the first poll question, um, what are we looking at these things uh, were found on the underside of an eggplant leaf. So take a good look at these and I'll stop sharing and Steph can put the poll up. You might want to leave it up, John. Oh, okay, leave it up. At it. Yeah, so folks go ahead and take a good look at it before I launch the poll because once okay. you launch it, um, the poll kind of like pops up in front of the picture. Oh, good, okay, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna launch and then we're gonna wait about one minute for everybody to have a chance to put their answer in. Okay, so the poll was launched. You should see it at this point, but if you don't, just try to check under some of the other windows that might be up on your computer because it does pop up in a separate window. All right, so it's been one minute. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. John, it looks like we might have accidentally put the <clears throat> answer at the bottom of this one. I'm just seeing that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I know folks are saying they can see the answer. And <clears throat> like, we don't even designate an answer in Zoom. I don't understand, but I didn't realize it was on the slide. Yeah. Sorry, uh, folks. Very sorry about <laughs> that. <laughs> Operator error, okay. <laughs> Good job, everybody. <laughs> Colorado potato beetle eggs. And um, let's see. Okay. Yes. And so we'll be talking about hand picking insect pests. And so looking for egg masses is really a great way to prevent problems. And these egg masses. Uh, once you know what to look for, you know, you can scout for them and just pull out that part of the leaf, drop it in soapy water, crush it, whatever you need to do, that'll prevent, um, you know, obviously the pest from emerging. Okay. 
So pest number two, Mexican bean beetle. Um, if you grow any kind of bean in Maryland, you're probably gonna see this pest at some point. Very similar to cucumber beetle in that there are multiple generations and overwinters in and around the garden. Luckily, it doesn't move very quickly and it is very easy to you know, um, sweep the, the adults off to hand pick the larvae. This is the bristly um, larval stage. Oh, I lost my annotator down here. And the egg masses that are laid usually on the undersides of the leaf. And you can see this is a skeletonizer, this beetle. When it feeds on the underside, it, it, it can't actually uh, chew all the way through the upper leaf surface. So it leaves this window painting kind of look to the leaves and eventually those you know um, feeding sites coalesce and the leaves look very chewed up and lace-like. So this is one that's really fairly easy to hand pick. Here's what we often see though, um, especially when I'm in community gardens or so many different folks growing beans at different times, we have overlapping generations of this pest. These are um, larvae that are, are moving into their pupil stage. The bristles are becoming uh, white and um, the, the bodies are smoother. You don't see the black bristles covering them. Um, so at this point, we really, uh, with the leaves this damaged, we would want to remove these plants. So there's something that we call destructive harvest, which simply means the plant is really at the end. Whatever disease or insect problem it has has gotten so bad that we're, we need to pull the plants out. Plus, we can then break the life cycle of this pretty significant pest. Pull the plants out, harvest the beans, stuff the plants in plastic bags and let them cook for a few weeks. Harlequin bug, um, very significant pest of all the members of the brassica family, the broccoli and cabbage family. Very similar to the previous two pests in that it overwinters around the garden, multiple generations. And so it's a bug. And what we're looking for in terms of a symptom are little white or yellowish um, spots or blotches on the leaf surface as we see here. That would be a symptom that's causing a change in the plant. And of course, a sign of the problem is actually seeing the adults, the nymphs, or the egg masses. And this is what the eggs look like, very distinctive. They're quite small, and I'll show you some when we look at the live samples, usually on the leaf underside. But you got to look really closely, you know, way down where the leaves attach to the base of the plant. And um, here are nymphs that are hatching out. Uh, this is an insect that goes through incomplete metamorphosis. So the, um, the little babies don't look exactly like the adults, but they don't look as, as different from the adults as, you know, we would see with caterpillars. Um, so what are we going to do? Um, well, we have, we have some good options. Uh, we definitely, and this is the case with all of our crops, whether we're talking about disease problems or insect issues, we want to get all of the crop debris out of the garden um, at the end of the growth cycle for the plant or the end of the gardening season. We have to scout for the, um, the adults, the nymphs, the eggs, and, and destroy them. We can cover our plants, and luckily this is not a plant requiring, requiring cross-pollination, so we can leave the covers on for long periods of time. We can directly contact the, the young nymphs with um, organic pesticides that can help to control them. Um, but be aware, if you grow this family, you know, throughout a good part of the gardening season, um, you're, you're going to see it for a good part of the gardening season. And so really controlling it early is really important. And um, just be on the lookout for harlequin bug. Here's another bug. So suck, piercing, sucking mouth parts of the squash bug, adult, and the nymphs will cause these little 
spots on the leaves that are called stipples. And here we can see on the underside, uh, eggs, they're, they're kind of feel kind of rubbery. Uh, they're this rust color. A lot of times it's just easier to tear out that part of the leaf and get rid of it. And then the early um, nymphs are out feeding. They have black legs and a green body. They really change in appearance quite a bit. Here, you know, later uh, instars are whiter in color and um, they do feed on all members of, uh, of this family. Significant pest. So what can we do about them? Um, well, monitoring, hand picking, and same with the, as we mentioned for the uh, harlequin bug, using a row cover. And um, planting late can also help us get around that um, those emerging overwintered adults. There's really pretty much only one generation of squash bug. And we can directly hit them, the young nymphs with insecticidal soap to, to help control them. Okay, so second poll question, the answer is not visible, thankfully. Take it away, Steph. All right, poll two. So go ahead and get a good look because as you remember, the poll window will pop up as soon as I press launch. So go ahead and get a good look at the photo and I will launch it and give folks one minute to respond. Wait about 20 more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Cool. Okay. All right, folks, be prepared to be amazed. <laughs> so um, this was spider mite feeding. And once you see it, and once you see the spider mites on the underside of the leaf, you won't forget it. Um, so it's a very fine stippling. And um, it's, I think this is a very underdiagnosed problem, especially if you're in a warmer part of the state, if you're in Baltimore City, or in a, in a very developed area where temperatures are gonna be higher, you're probably gonna see spider mites. So use a hand lens. Um, I don't have one next to me, oh, here it is. So as master gardeners, I know a lot of people use uh, loops or hand lenses, you'll need one or a magnifying glass to see the spider mites on the undersides of the leaf. Um, early on, you can possibly use soap or oil to control them, but once, you get a ripping population and they're causing this much injury, you can actually make the problem worse by using a, a, a miticide of any kind. So just be aware they're out there. They like it hot and dry. And so one thing you can actually do, um, you know, this week it's gonna be hot, it's still gonna be humid, but uh, rinsing plants off in the morning uh, increases humidity and they don't like that. They don't like wet, humid, uh, conditions. So that's spider mites. Okay, and the last one, um, squash vine borer, another super major pest. Uh, it's, there are two generations uh, a year. This is the one, you know, plants are wilted, uh, squash plants, um, and you really, or pumpkin, if it's not water uh, or bacterial wilt disease, it's, it's probably gonna be squash vine borer. And you can look at the lower stem for signs of 
entry, you'll see that wet looking sawdust material, uh, the frass that's been pushed out. And um, you know, if you slip up the stem from that entrance point with a razor, you can locate the larva and, and remove it and then actually mound soil up over the plant. If you have a plant that's rooting at different locations along the stem, it's gonna be more uh, resilient and, and may not go down, but this pest will feed for a month or more um, inside the plants. So what can we do? We, we can prevent the problem, um, hopefully by either delaying planting or putting out you know, transplants during the normal planting time, mid or late May, to get a head start on the season. Row cover is really gonna be very helpful. Um, you can plant, squash, you know, uh, summer squash several times during the growing season. We can spray or dust the lower stems of our plants uh, with an organic insecticide or, or actually wrap the stems to prevent the female from uh, laying her eggs. Here are some squash um, that, and th that are actually resistant to uh, squash vine borer. And a lot of people appreciate that and are growing them for that reason. So once we know we've got a problem, as I mentioned, we can remove the bores, um, you know, get rid of the plant, don't leave those larvae out there, you gotta kill them. Uh, and actually there's research showing that injecting Bt bacillus thuringiensis into the stem of plants that have young larvae will, will kill them. It's actually pretty effective, but that's, not a technique that's going to work for everybody. And finally, and you know, this isn't meant to sound uh, smart, but uh, or or smart alecky, but I know a lot of great gardeners that just say, you know what, it's not worth it. These plants take up a lot of room in the garden. I can buy squash relatively cheaply at the farmers market. I'm done with vine borers, and that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, we, we often get asked about wildlife um, as extension folks, and um, I, this is the only slide I have, but just to emphasize the importance of excluding wildlife, whether it's a fence um, with mesh small enough to keep rabbits and, and voles out with, um, lower right here, this is tool that can be used um, you know, to cover plants. This is, these are blueberry plants under the tool. And I think I'm seeing more people upper right here um, going full bore with a, 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 ca a walk-in cage uh, that will keep birds and squirrels and deer out, um, could actually then be uh, kind of repurposed to create a, a small greenhouse. So th these kinds of protective coverings um, I think are going to be seen more and more um, as our garden spaces get smaller, more intensive. And uh, I think they will be cost saving and, and seen as very effective. So th this is just a list. This is all in the handbook that um, is being made available to you. So I'm not going to dwell on this because I wanted to get to a couple of the environmental problems before our time is up for this section. Um, so abiotic problems. So many times we and our clients um, will see a symptom on a plant and immediately assume it's got to be a disease or an insect pest cause problem and um, when it's not. So here are just examples of problems that we, many of us are familiar with, blossom and rot. That looks like a disease. Um, Twisted leaves, you know, viruses cause twisting in leaves. This is herbicide injury, very common in spring and early summer. And on the right, these, uh, th this kind of um, burn symptom uh, is often mistaken for disease. And in this case, it's just cold temperature injury that produced uh, this symptom. So this is just a partial list of all the possible causes of, of you know, plant problems, of some symptom developing in a plant. And 
um, we know that really probably more than half of all the plants presented to us uh, are abiotic problems. And I just wanted to cover a couple. Um, this is a major one. We, we get questions about all the time, how come I'm not seeing any squash fruits forming? Um, and of course that could be because we're gonna get mostly male flowers at the, at the beginning with our summer squash. Um, or my flowers drop or the small fruits develop, but they drop. So there are a lot of possible reasons for these different issues, right? And um, there are also some solutions. So we can you know, take good care of our plant. We can make sure they have the room they need. Be patient, the female flowers will come eventually. We can hand pollinate. We have a nice link on our squash page to a, um, a page showing you know, how to hand pollinate multiple plantings. If it's a problem whereby we don't have enough pollinators around, then we need to stop using insecticides and plant for our pollinators. So lower left, you know, just showing the difference here between the male and female flowers. Of course, the male flower is on a long stem pedestal. That's not a fruit, that's the nectary down here. But on any female flower in this cucurbitaceae family, you'll see the little immature, unfertilized fruit <clears throat> underneath the flower. And here are some examples of parthenocarpic varieties. So these are summer squashes that will set fruit without um, pollinators moving pollen between flowers. Okay, I think that takes us to the break. And so I'd like to take any questions now. Awesome, that'd be great, you've got quite a few. All right, so our first one is, why does increased carbon dioxide favor weeds? That's a really good question. And I can't remember the specific reasons. Um, it, 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 could be because they're wilder plants. They haven't been bred, um, you know, over many, many years, like our food crops, which are wimpier in a lot of ways. Uh, but I don't know specifically why that is, but it has been observed. So they are favored over grain crops, especially. That's where I've seen the research, you know, the comparisons. Um, but we know poison ivy and a lot of other um, weeds, some in, invasives uh, are growing at more rapid rates. We know that's happening with all plants. Increased CO2 can do that, but they are being favored. And I, I can't tell you exactly why, but maybe we can provide that later to the group. Send some yeah, research links. I, I did find a journal article. I looked it up when we first got this question and there's an article um, in weed science from Cambridge that to sum it up in very non-scientific terms, um, it stimulates the photosynthesis and growth in the weeds more, and it also increases their water use efficiency so they're able to grow better. Good, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next one is, my asparagus has been decimated by the asparagus beetle. I have handpicked for weeks and the beetle, the beetle and the worm. Neem oil didn't seem to make any difference. Do you have any recommendations for that? Um, off the top of my head, and I, again, we need to make sure this is correct, but I think spinosad may be the most effective organic insecticide um, for controlling asparagus beetle. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one, it just says what's best to use for wrapping, but it came when you were talking about squash vine borer. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? The, yeah, the question yeah. Here says what's best to use for wrapping. Oh, what's best to use. I know yeah. people use aluminum foil. Um, you could use really any kind of fabric that would prevent, if it's a tight weave, because I don't know how he, you know, what size hole would allow the female to deposit her egg. Um, it, it obviously would go through insect netting. So probably something that's solid like aluminum foil would be the best thing to use. Okay. Um, do birds get caught in the micro mesh? 
I haven't heard that that's a problem. You know, birds get caught in bird netting. I haven't heard about them getting caught in micro mesh. I think that the mesh is small enough. It would be kind of surprising if they did to me. Okay, the next question is, you mentioned diatomaceous earth for squash vine borer. Have you found it to be effective against any other pests? I have only used diatomaceous earth a few times many, many years ago. I know it is effective against cutworm. So, um, and that's one that people use it most for in my experience. So beyond cutworms, um, I'm not sure. I know some people tell me they have sprinkled it on for other insect pests, but I don't know what the research says about that. And maybe that's something else we can find some links for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Could you share the types of squash other than butternut that are resistant to squash fine borer? Yeah, it's um, tromboncino is one. And it actually, when it's immature, it, it's similar to zucchini. And Kakutsi is another one. If you search the Maryland Grows uh, blog, you'll find a couple of nice articles by Erica Smith because they grew this, uh, the, these different uh, resistant types at the uh, Montgomery County Master Gardener Demonstration Garden. Awesome. All right, next one. One of the pictures in your slideshow just reminded me of an issue I'm having powdery mildew. They have it on a dogwood tree and they're not sure how to remedy it given that it's a larger tree. Yeah, powdery mildew is a huge problem with dogwood and over time that plus other stressors can really debilitate the tree. Um, go, go to our website. We've got a lot of good information uh, on that. You know, if it's a small specimen tree, you could potentially apply a fungicide, but that would be early in the season. But I would say go to our webpage on dogwood problems. Okay. Um, and then another question regarding the squash stems. Um, what would you use to wrap them, which we talked about, but also can you show the image of the varieties of squash that start without pollination? Yeah, we, I, I, should I put them in the chat maybe? That way yeah. everybody will see, yeah. Okay, I'll do that at the break. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, and someone asked specifically about using tin foil, so they're on the right track, good job. Um, are heirloom veggie varieties less adaptable to changes in climate? That's an interesting question. I mean, in one respect, we would say that they should be better adapted because people if they're a true heirloom, they've been grown in different areas. People have been selecting the best individuals each generation that you know withstand different problems each season. So over time, you could actually select for traits in those heirloom plants that would make them better adapted overall to mm -hmm. a changing climate. <clears throat> On the other side though, when it comes to disease issues, they tend, they are just less uh, resistant or tolerant to a lot of our vegetable diseases. And that, that's one disadvantage. All right, moving through, we've still got quite a few questions to go through. Um, have you found kale and clay to be effective against flea beetles? Yes, yeah, we actually did a research project uh, years ago at our uh, research farm here and it, it was statistically significant, the, the results we got. So it does work for flea beetle um, control or it's, it helps to suppress flea beetle. So yes, I would say definitely. I personally, I feel like it's just easier to use the row cover because then you know you're excluding them. With the kale and clay, you may have to reapply it, but it, it does work. Also, we found it can suppress and deter cucumber beetles. Uh, but unfortunately, because it only takes a few beetles feeding on a leaf to transmit bacterial wilt disease, it really didn't reduce the overall amount of bacterial wilt. But um, I think kale and clay is really valuable. I know of one community garden where it was used extensively for years on a variety of plants, and they really liked it. It just it takes some effort. Uh, you know, it's not 
it, it, it's, a, it's heavy. So to buy it and have it shipped can run into some money. Um, it can clog up a sprayer if you don't really agitate it and clean it out good, but it, it is effective. Got it. All right, next one. Um, I have peach trees, common problems, huge fruit drop early on, fungus, so browning fruits around ripening time, squirrels, birds, weeping sores on trees and wasps. What can I do? Are they salvageable for future years or should they be destroyed? We get so many questions along those lines. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're in a very humid part of the country. We have a lot of insect and disease pests in our stone fruits. If you're not prepared to spray synthetic you know, fungicides and insecticides, it can be very difficult. So that's the bottom line. I mean, you can reclaim a tree that's had problems, but you have to put a lot of time into it. And invariably uh, it's gonna require spraying. So that's just a decision you have to weigh. And then also related peach tree question, they, this person has new peach tree seedlings and how far away should they be planted to be safe from the fungus? And is the soil around the original trees with the fungus contaminated or in, if so, can it be treated? No, any stumps from previous peach trees aren't gonna transmit brown rot if that's the main concern here. And the, the, the spores are gonna be moving through the air. So whether trees are 15 feet apart or 50 feet apart won't make any difference if one tree is infected and the pathogen's not being controlled, it'll move to the other tree. All right, what about slugs? There were so many of them this year. There, there's a really good um, slug, a new slug article on Maryland Grows. So please look at that. It's by two um, grad students from the entomology department. And I think they give some really good um, prevention and control information. Okay. Um, we have a question about potato leaf hoppers. They appeared this year after the big storm last week. How can they control them and keeping from infesting all their plants? They don't like covering beans and leaf crops with organic pesticides. Yeah, I mean, early on is when we see the most damage, like late spring on potato and bean in particular. Um, my own experience is, yeah, they're, they're out there, you know, you you uh, manipulate your leaves, you see them fly up, but usually the damage isn't that significant. So if you're seeing some feeding, and even though it seems like there are a lot of them, it may not really require any control. Even when we see a lot of, um, you know, firing or browning mm -hmm. of leaf edges, that hopper burn, that doesn't necessarily translate into a reduction in yield. But if you were going to use something, I know I've used neem oil, and didn't feel, I, I had to apply it multiple times to get decent control. So there again, spinosad is probably going to be the most effective insecticide if you were going to use one. Although you don't want to spray that when flowers are open because it can um, injure bees. Got it. Um, there's a question about if it's okay to eat stink bug damage. And I'm Happy to take this one because I learned from Emily Zobel at our Grow It, Eat It summer at potluck meeting last week that you totally can eat the stink bug damage. Of course, wash it first, just with any other fruit or vegetable. Um, but she did a lot of research on stink bugs and ate a lot of produce that had damage from stink bugs and she is fine. <laughs> yeah, just don't eat the stink bugs. They don't taste too good. But it brings up a good point, which is, you know, we get asked a lot about disease injured or insect injured fruits and vegetables. And invariably, as long as the eating quality is still good, you know, it's not a rotten fruit. Um, yes, you can eat it. You know, leaves that have leaf spots, if it's beet leaves and there's Cercospora leaf spot, um, you know, lesions on it. Yeah, you can, you can eat them and they will not harm you. 
Okay, how can you prevent blossom end rot in tomatoes that are grown in pots during wet, humid Maryland weather? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're going to be more susceptible than plants in the ground because they have a smaller you know, amount of media to draw from. So it's just keep that root system moist. I would put about a quarter cup of gypsum in the container or, you know, per plant, an eighth to a cup, eighth of a cup to a quarter of a cup. There's research that is also suggesting now that it's not just um, water deficits, but other stressors, other plant stressors can end up triggering this problem where calcium is not being distributed throughout the plant and reaching the bottoms of the fruit. So just try to grow your plants as best as you can. Um, and, you know, and don't over fertilize with nitrogen. That can also actually lead to some blossom and rot. Awesome. All right. So um, we definitely need to take a break. There are a couple more questions in the chat, but um, John, if you don't mind, I'm going to just have you type answers in. Sorry to put you to work during the break. Um, and we also had a request to put today's schedule in the chat so folks can kind of follow along. OK. All right. Sounds good. So um, what would you like to do for the break? I know we're a little off. Yeah, I don't know. Um, it, we don't want to go over. You're right. Do you want to just do like five minutes? Yeah, let's try to just do five. Yep. All right. Sounds good. All right. So we'll be back in five, everyone. Ready to keep going. Okay, folks, I'll try to get us back on track here. So, um, Diseases that displease us. Uh, here are a couple that look pretty alarming, but would not typically be seen by most gardeners. Um, this one on the left is uh, buckeye rot, which is caused by different Phytophthora species. It's soil borne. So in this case, the tomato plants were on the ground. They weren't staked. And the, the fruits were actually contacting the soil and cause this really bad rot. Um, circular, uh, sort of concentric uh, rings, not one you would typically see. On the right, another one that in most years we don't see it, but you will occasionally. And this is um, anthracnose in beans. There are a lot of anthracnose um, attacks many different crops. It's the same genus, but different species of anthracnose. Um, and this is a case where, you know, wet, humid weather, and that's what we've been in, will really encourage pathogens. And especially when, you know, plants are being watered overhead or they're crowded, um, it, it really can increase the incidence. So first thing I want to really, um, I want to share and emphasize, and that is using disease resistant cultivars. There are many to choose from. And Cornell University has done a fabulous job of maintaining list of these varieties. They're updated. The um, web pages they put together also include sources of seeds um, for gardeners and commercial growers. So, all you have to do is in your browser type in Cornell disease resistant vegetables, you know, because the URL is super long and you'll find these pages and um, it's, it's very helpful. And we, we send people there all the time and so do a lot of other universities. So use their information. And I really wanted to focus on the cucumber family and the tomato family in particular, or tomatoes in particular, because these families tend to have the most diseases um, or gardeners are facing problems, uh, disease problems with those families more than with other families. So just to let you know, uh, when it comes to the cucumber family, there are many, many leaf spot diseases and we see two of them here on the right, anthracnose, on the left, angular leaf spot, which is actually a bacterial um, disease. And so 
um, the lesions are often confined by the, the leaf veins, but there are many different diseases. Uh, some of them look very similar to one another. And you know, just as an example, there are several of these leaf spot diseases where the lesions will dry and the centers will drop out like we see here with the anthracnose. And so we can't just say, oh yeah, we know it's this or it's that disease without it going to the lab and being confirmed. But we can prevent and manage these diseases in very similar ways, you know, using resistant varieties. And we'll go over some of the best practices that'll help minimize the problem. But my point really uh, with this slide is to say, if you're growing anything in this family, you're probably going to see at least one disease, if not more. In wet, humid, warm weather, the diseases will progress and very well may kill the plants or debilitate them before they even start producing very well, which is really unfortunate. And I'll share a few others. Uh, somebody mentioned powdery mildew before. This is a, the classic symptom on the upper leaf surface. And powdery mildew, th there are lots of different powdery mildews um, that they will grow very well and spread during dry weather. And, you know, I, sometimes they, they can really be debilitating for the plants. Um, there are quite a few resistant varieties. I don't see it as a major disease problem. Now look at this photo on the right. You can see faint symptoms of powdery mildew on, on this leaf, but you also see a lot of spotting. And that spotting is actually caused by a virus. And there are many different viruses of plants in this family. And they are transmitted sometimes by seed and, you know, also by insect pest. So, uh, you know, we can see multiple symptoms, multiple pathogens, you know, on a plant at one time, of course. Now, here's one of the most significant diseases of the cucumber family. It's probably under recognized. It's a huge problem for commercial growers, especially our pumpkin growers. It's downy mildew. And there are actually two types of cucurbit downy mildew. One group, one type um, will infect cucumber and muskmelon, and the other will infect watermelon, squash, and pumpkin. So for cucumber, this is the typical initial symptom, this you know, yellowing in, in blotches on the leaf, and it'll just progress very rapidly. When weather is warm and moist, you flip the leaf over and you'll see this grayish, purplish, fuzzy growth. And that's the sporulation occurring. And so th those plants just need to be pulled up. And we'll talk a little bit later about, you know, if you were gonna apply a fungicide, an organic fungicide, when, you know, would that happen? And how, to, how you could possibly prevent some of these problems. But the, the take home message here is, this is a disease that does not overwinter in Maryland. It blows in both from you know, cucumber growing areas uh, in Ohio where they do a lot of greenhouse crops and also from the South. And it's a disease that arrives earlier and earlier every year. It used to be, we didn't see this until way deep into July or August. And um, the first cases in the mid Atlantic were mid June. So it's here and um, it's very significant. So this is one where it's really worth keeping up with which of the, the varieties of the plants you like to grow in this family have resistance to this disease. And you know this disease keeps evolving. So breeders uh, keep needing to you know, develop the latest varieties that are resistant to the latest new strains of the, of the disease. So Danny mildew is a bad one. Bacterial will, um, another heartbreaker, right? If you're growing cucumbers and you know you've been watering and it's been raining, but the, you know, the plants are wilting and um, it only takes 
very minor cucumber beetle feeding um, to transmit this disease. It's actually spread through the feces, not through the mouth parts of the insects. There's nothing you can do. Once you see this kind of wilting, just pull the plants up and start over. There's one variety called County Fair. County Fair, it's a pickling cucumber. It, it has genetic resistance. It's just a, a fluke thing, but um, it, it has genetic resistance and uh, it's a pickling cucumber. All the others can get it. Um, so controlling cucumber beetles is the way to prevent this disease. If, if you are wondering if you have it, you can cut a, um, a stem where you, you see wilting of the leaves, remove that whole stem, then take a piece of the stem and cut it in half and put it in some room temperature water. And if the bacterial, uh, if the bacterium is inside the plant, you'll see this milky white oozing out of the stem into the water. So that's a, a confirmation of the disease. This is not a major disease problem, but we see it every year. And again, when it's warm, humid, wet, we see more of it. It's a fungal disease that starts on the blossom of our squash plants and then moves into the young fruits. So one way to help prevent the problem is as soon as you know that the, the blossom is drying, the female blossom is dying and the fruit is enlarging, just pull that blossom off so it doesn't become a source of infection. And Steph, I think we've got our third poll question. Yep, so folks, make sure you take a good look at the photo before I put the poll up. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll and give folks one minute to answer. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Cool. All right, I'll go ahead and close it so folks can see the slide again. Okay, so actually it is hot weather and high solar incidence, intense sunlight. We're seeing more of this, you know, raspberry, we're, we're really, pushing it in a lot of parts of the state, um, growing June bearing raspberries. Um, they like it a little further north, but we, you know, we do grow great raspberries in Maryland. But this, this issue, it's called white droplet disorder. We are seeing it more, you'll see it more in raspberry than in blackberry. Um, and really th there's nothing you can do um, about it. And, um, you know, those, some people may find they can actually use those fruits, but the, the individual droplets get hard and dry. So this is, again, another climate change influence disorder. Okay, let's get into the tomatoes now. I think a lot of folks have a lot of experience, if, you, if you've been growing vegetables, with some of the foliar leaf spot diseases that can really denude a tomato plant in a hurry in our Maryland summers. And this is why commercial growers, you know, are on a spray schedule with fungicides as soon as the plants go in the field. These diseases are seed borne, they're in the soil on old crop debris. Some of them can survive in the soil without crop debris. Um, and so we, we, they're cosmopolitan diseases. We see them every year. So early blight is one of them very distinctive lesions, 
target um, pattern when we look closely, often a yellow halo. Then septoria leaf spot is the other major one. Smaller lesions with a gray or tan center. Um, and, and then those spots will coalesce and the whole leaf will yellow and you know, die. So these diseases often co-occur. And <clears throat> these are just some important things to know about them. They will appear, the lesions will appear on leaves and stems. And the disease really starts on the lower leaves. <clears throat> it'll splash up from the soil and it'll progress all the way up to the top of the plant. It can spread rapidly. Um, you know, it's, it's here, it's not blowing in from out of state. And the first symptoms I, I've just, you know, uh, described to you. And we have pages on our website on both of these diseases. So what can we do about it? Well, there aren't really good resistant varieties per se. Um, some varieties are more or less susceptible. Um, spacing plants, giving them more space is really important. You know, uh, removing excess suckers. Another, and I'll show a slide of this in a minute, but re removing lower leaf branches as a way of um, increasing the distance between you know, the soil and the lower part of the plant is helpful. Removing excess suckers, it'll increase air circulation you know, watering at the base of the plant. Now, fungicides. So we can use uh, copper, liquid copper. And if we apply it, um, when we first see symptoms, it can help protect the foliage that's not infected yet. Getting rid of all the crop debris at the end of the season, important, and rotating where possible. That's not always possible. And I know that, especially if you have a small garden, there's like this one spot where I can grow my tomatoes, that's my number one concern. It is the number one backyard food crop, not surprisingly. And so it's not always possible for people to, to move their uh, location, but if you can, it will be helpful. So here are just shots of, um, this is a before. You can see uh, foliage all the way down to the ground and you know, the, the leaf shoots are at an angle here. They're not at a 90 degree angle. It's, you know, more than 90. So the leaves are, do tend to move toward the ground. But here on the right, you can see the difference. You know, we've removed the lower three, four, five leaf branches. This is after fruiting has begun. The plants are well-established and healthy. That's going to really um, improve air circulation. And down here on the lower left, you can see it looks much more dramatic in this photo with no lower leaf branches. There, this year, we've gotten more questions about wilted tomato plants. I'm not quite sure why, <clears throat> but there are several diseases that will cause wilt. And really the most prevalent is fusarium wilt. And on the left here is, and I just wanted you to keep this in mind, a lot of people will see this as wilting. They would describe this as wilting, but um, oftentimes when we have dead or declining branches on a tomato plant that have been really hit hard by foliar diseases, people will say that their branches are wilting. So we really have to be careful with the, with the words we use. This is, you know, these are healthy green leaves that go limp. That is wilting. And in this case, these two slides are not actually connected. But um, on the right, you can see a confirming symptom of fusarium wilt, and that is the vascular tissue right under the skin, the epidermis of the stem of affected stems, we see um, browning. And so the, the vascular tissue is blocked up with the pathogen and water can't move up into the uh, into the canopy. So lots of resistant varieties are available. Be aware this disease has at least, we know of three races or strains of this particular disease. So seed catalogs will let you know if the, the, the cultivar has resistance to fusarium wilt and then which of the races um, it's resistant to. 
Okay, I wanted to really um, help folks think about how they can increase their yields of tomatoes this summer. And I know a lot of people are really focused on getting vine ripened tomatoes, you know, that have been kissed by the sun up until they're plucked from the vine and turned into something marvelous in the kitchen. And I'm here to tell you, if you wait for your tomatoes to turn full ripe red or whatever color they're gonna turn to on the vine, you're setting yourself up for a lot of problems. So here we could see tomato fruit worm that's entered a ripening tomato. Lower right here, this is anthracnose, which is a very common um, fruit disorder. And it, it becomes much worse as fruits are ripening. And then of course, um, cracking, in this case, concentric cracking, but we also can get radial cracking as the fruit skin um, you know, hardens and the plant's still pulling up a lot of moisture, cracking is gonna happen. So my advice is pick your tomatoes when they are just barely turning. In the tray, th these are called breakers. They're just barely turning on the bottom. You bring them indoors on the kitchen counter, they will ripen beautifully. And with our great, you know, homegrown, you know, home garden varieties, um, you will not notice a difference in flavor or texture. These aren't shipping tomatoes that are going to be tasteless, whether, you know, they're vine ripened or ripened off the vine. These are nice, you know, better boys and Amish paste, et cetera, et cetera. Just try it. And what you'll notice is you'll reduce the risks of all these problems and you'll have more to eat, which is really what we're all interested in. And another poll question, Steph. All right, remember to take a look at the photo, I'll give folks one more second to look at that. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll question for one minute. Okay, the poll is open. Thirty more seconds. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and we'll share the results. All right, pretty good consensus on this one. Excellent, yeah, very good. So correct, bacterial um, leaf spot of pepper and um, it, it's the most common disease overall of pepper in home gardens in Maryland. Um, if we went up to New Jersey, the biggest problem they have is actually Phytophthora root rot in uh, their commercial fields. Uh, but this, this usually is not a super significant disease, but um, it's one where if you have it and it's been a problem, you can find resistant cultivars. Wanted to mention, and I have a live sample of this, uh, basil downy mildew. I, I don't know, I think maybe the word hasn't gotten around that there are resistant varieties because I continue to see people growing um, susceptible varieties, and you are going to get this disease every year um, if you if you don't grow resistant varieties. So we've been seeing it for you know quite a few years now. Um, there are resistant varieties. Last year, uh, Jerry Brust, our IPM vegetable specialist, did a trial, and Dave Clement and Stan Gill did a, a separate um, trial, and included some of the 
resistant cultivars. And a lot of them are coming out of Rutgers. They've had a really great breeding program. Um, so these first uh, four varieties are all from Rutgers. Prospera is an Israeli cultivar. And um, for the first few years, the Rutgers cultivars were giving 100% um, you know, control. They, they had no symptoms of basal uh, downy mildew, but in, in recent years, late in the season, the disease has been breaking through. So they'll probably go back. I don't know what's happening with the breeding program. My assumption is they'll be tinkering with their breeding project. I know the Israelis had the same problem. They had breakthrough infections and then they reintroduced Prospera. And so far in what I can see, it's the one I grow myself, but in talking to other gardeners, I, I think it's been very good. Although I did hear it from Montgomery County that they actually saw it in their demo garden, I believe uh, in recent years, they did see infection in Prospera. So nothing is foolproof, but um, we wanna at least focus on and grow those varieties that have purported resistance to this disease. So we had some peach questions earlier. And I guess the one thing I do wanna say about fruit diseases is that um, they are plentiful. Um, it, it's very difficult in Maryland, as I mentioned, to grow peach and cherry, and I'll include apple in that as well. Um, grow those tree fruits successfully without pesticides. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you have to really become very knowledgeable and uh, stay on top of things and you know find non-chemical solutions. There are some, you know, it can be done, but it's not easy. So we try to get people to focus on the small fruits, fewer problems. Of course, here's grape, a small fruit, and it does have one major, major problem that a lot of backyard uh, folks will see, and that is black rot starts on the foliage and then moves to the fruit. And we'll see, you know, just a blackening and a shriveling of the fruits until they become mummies. And here's brown rot on peach. And it's the number one fruit disease of, um, of stone fruits in Maryland. And actually the way growers prevent the pathogen from infecting the fruit is they're spraying when the blooms are first open with fungicides. So it, it, it takes a lot of um, effort and um, planning and unfortunately spraying in most cases. Now, you may be able to grow a perfect peach tree and I've seen this in my old uh, neighborhood in Baltimore City. There were some apple and peach trees that were remarkably free of problems. And that's because there weren't a lot of other peach and apple trees around. But once the diseases and pests find you, then you're gonna see them for a while. So I think we just have a few more slides. So we'll have a little more time for questions, but I did wanna just focus on, this is kind of a summary of a lot of the things we've been talking about, right? So, you know, best practices, for preventing diseases, using resistant varieties. When it comes to plants that are vegetatively propagated, you know, we don't buy potato seeds, we buy the um, potato seed stock, the, the actual tubers. And we wanna make sure that those are disease-free, that we're buying them from a reputable company. We're not using potatoes from the supermarket. Increasing the health of the soil. The more biologically active the soil is, the fewer soil-borne disease problems we're gonna have. We wanna make sure our sites you know, drain well. We wanna give plants everything they need to grow well. We don't wanna water uh, our plants at night if we can help it, at least avoid getting the foliage wet. Harvesting um, you know, on a consistent basis. And when it's possible to harvest things like tomatoes, that will ripen off the vine uh, to do so, to pick them early, that, that's really a good practice. Garden sanitation is so important as is keeping weeds to a minimum because a lot of the weeds that pop up in and around our gardens can uh, be host plants for 
pathogens and um, an insect pest. So just wanted to cover something um, on fungicides. And that is if we're going to use a, a fungicide and as organic gardeners, it's probably going to be copper or sulfur. And I put organic in quotations because obviously these are not organic substances, but they are approved for organic agriculture. They're elements and um, they can be effective. And then of course there are synthetic protectant or contact fungicides that are available. And uh, some people may have used these as well. So just so um, you know, we're on the same page in terms of fungicides, these fungicides will not cure a problem. So if we have symptoms that have been really um, progressing and, and people are seeing them kind of late in the game, you know, spraying is not going to help at all. Uh, these fungicides are going to be most helpful if they're going to be used um, either before symptoms are seen for diseases where we know we're going to get them, right? Like early blight, septoria leaf spot, or waiting until we see the very first symptoms appear. Um, they're, they're good in the sense that um, it's difficult for pathogens to develop resistance to them. Although that has shown up in New Jersey with copper applied to peppers to control bacterial leaf spots. And now there are strains or, you know, there are populations of that pathogen that are, are seem to be resistant to copper, which is a real concern. So these fungicides have to be applied before the pathogen gets there and they can wash off and, and need to be reapplied. Um, here are some others that you may see in garden catalogs and, and commercial growers are using them, certainly organic farmers are. And these are the biological fungicides, if you will, that um, have different modes of action. In some cases, they're antagonistic to pathogens. They may be able to colonize roots or a leaf surface and outcompete pathogens. Uh, in some cases, you've seen them mixed into soilless potting mixes like uh, pro mix. And, and they can be very effective. And some people spray compost tea, which can also be effective. And here are some things that really research has shown are not very effective, especially in a real life in the field situation. So some of these um, like citric acid, the botanicals, mint, cinnamon, um, hydrogen peroxide, not very effective. Okay, so this is part three. So we can, I'll stop sharing my screen and we can uh, take some more questions. Awesome. All right, so our first one is, um, do you have a favorite way to keep squirrels out of fruit trees? Oh boy, yes, yeah, squirrels, <laughs> they're, they're killing me now. Um, I was able to keep them out of my blueberries uh, oh, I'm sorry, we're talking squirrels. I'm so thinking about those darn cat birds. Squirrels, <laughs> I, um, I have lots of squirrels around my garden. They even get in my garden. They haven't been feeding on my figs or my tomatoes. And that's knocking on wood because I know for some people, squirrels are horrible. Um, so you just have to find some exclusionary, you know, material. And that it depends how much trouble you really want to go to, whether you're going to put a wire cage around your tree. You can bag fruit. Um, people bag individual apples, peaches. I've seen squirrels untie the strings on bags around figs. Uh, and so squirrels are very tough. I don't know if anybody has ways they've successfully dealt with squirrels. Some people actually trap them and move them. And that's not always possible or legal, but uh, squirrels can be very difficult. Yep. Um, we talked about the white droplet disorder with the raspberries. Someone's yeah. asking if shade cloth might help for that. Yeah, you know, I don't know of any research, uh, but that certainly would stand to reason. Um, if you could 
do it. You know, if you could arrange for that, then I would definitely try it. If you're having a problem, like if you have raspberries that are in full, full sun and you're seeing this a lot, it would be worth trying. Got it. Um, we have someone with giant sunflowers and for the past two years, they've got something that looks just like early blight. Are there any ideas what that is? Yeah, I'm not sure if that's an alternaria. Maybe um, Re or somebody can help me out on that. I know there are a couple of common diseases we see on sunflower, but I cannot remember what yeah, no are. worries. We've also got um, Dave Clement as our plant pathologist, and he helps with the ask extension question answers. So for that person, if you'd like to send your photo into ask extension, this would be a great opportunity to do so. And Dave can help diagnose that for you. Yeah. All right. Can you comment on growing marigolds in with tomato plants? Um, what's their role in reducing nematodes on tomatoes? Yeah, so there's been some research done. I mean, one thing marigolds do, um, you know, support natural enemies, uh, a good source of nectar. Um, and there's been research showing that they can suppress nematode populations. Um, so if you knew you had root knot nematode in your soil, that may be something to try. But if you if you haven't confirmed the nematode problem, then um, I wouldn't assume that you have one. Mm -hmm. Got it. When you purchase peaches from local orchards, what questions should we be asking about regarding pesticides? Is there anything they should absolutely not be using? Yeah, well, the main thing is to add, commercial growers are going to be using registered products, you know, that are recommended that have proven effective. And the reason is these materials are getting more and more expensive. And so farmers are trying to use the absolute minimum that they can. So applying them at just the right time, using the minimum amount. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, it's perfectly fine to ask, you know, growers, uh, you know, what are you using? But um, th they're really all following IPM principles because mm -hmm. it's the only way they can stay in business. Yeah, and sort of related, are there sources of small amounts of spray controls if you're just growing a few plants? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, garden centers um, have them. You know, you can buy a quart or a pint of a, a particular material, organic insecticide or whatever you're interested in. And also online gardening supply companies and seed companies uh, carry them as well. Got it. Thank you. What are the best flowers to plant in the garden to attract the parasitic wasps that attack tobacco and tomato hornworms? Yeah, you know, there are so many. Uh, anything in the mint family is going to be good. You know, zinnias and marigolds and alyssum and uh, cosmos and uh, anise hyssop. And, you know, there, there are just many. Again, you want plants that produce small flowers and have them in flower for as, you know, a greater part of the growing season as possible, even into, you know, late summer, like asters and so forth. Got it. Um, is there an, is an iron-based herbicide effective for weed control? Yeah, you know, I know that since Montgomery County outlawed, um, synthetic pesticides for home lawns that they've included some information on their website. I'm not personally familiar with, um, with those and couldn't tell you how effective they are or are not. I can tell you the soaps um, that are herbicidal or sold to control weeds are, are maybe can burn down the tops of some annual weeds but are not gonna be very effective for perennial weeds or long season control. And the same is true for vinegar. Even the vinegar, the acetic acid products that are, you know, have a high percentage of acetic acid, like up to 20%, that they're somewhat effective on annual leaves on the top growth, but not for perennial weeds. Got it. Um, one person has read that hydrogen peroxide added to water can help kill fungus gnats that kill seedlings. 
they said it seems to be working for them. And when they collect rainwater to water their plants, they also use a little bit of hydrogen peroxide to kill the mosquito larvae from there. Um, is there any harm, I think, in terms of harm to the plants in using the hydrogen peroxide? So the last part of the question, um, I, if you haven't noticed any, any injury to your plants, then there's probably not a real danger, you know, to you or the plants. But we recommend that people not um, use home remedies because they're untested. You can't burn your plants. Um, and I know a lot of people do anyway. They use detergents instead of buying insecticidal soap. Mm -hmm. Insecticidal soap's been formulated specifically, you know, to not burn plants. And if it's used according to label directions, it's effective. I'm not saying detergents couldn't work and in a lot of cases, you know, perform similarly, but it's best not to um, rely on things you pick up on the internet. I haven't heard about hydrogen peroxide being used to kill uh, fungus gnat larvae. Um, so it'd be interesting. You know, what you can do too, if you're interested, if you pull up Google Scholar, and mm -hmm. type in some of these terms, you'll find out whether anybody's actually been researching um, hydrogen peroxide used in this way. Got it. All right, and then related to seedlings as well, if we are growing seedlings to give to new gardeners that are growing for the first time, how many plants of each <laughs> should they plant to get a successful crop? And what varieties for cherry tomatoes tomatoes, cucumber, and squash are suggested? Yeah, we don't have um, recommended varieties on our website. And what I always tell people, really, we're lucky in Maryland. I mean, if you go through any seed catalog, you'd be hard pressed to find a variety of any of our common vegetable crops that won't perform well. I mean, so it's usually a matter of which ones are disease resistant or what size fruit do I want or color fruit or whatever, you know? Okay. But um, as far as how many uh, seedlings to give people, it really depends on the size of the garden, how much time that people have to take care of the plants. But with all of our crops, you really only need one plant to mm -hmm. produce something, some food to eat. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, couple more questions and then a couple more minutes till our break. What are the advantages of planting through landscape fabric for preventing soil dwelling diseases or pests? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't know that, I don't know of any research that addresses this specifically. I'll tell you some of the advantages, advantages of landscape fabric and a lot of organic commercial growers use landscape fabric and they burn or cut holes and, uh, put their plants in or seeds in, and they'll reuse it at the end of the year. So the advantages are, as with any mulch, you're helping to conserve soil moisture, you're keeping weeds down. Um, it can increase the temperature of the soil, but not as much as black plastic. Mm -hmm. but as far as the disease and pest issue, um, it could prevent soil splashing or limit it to some degree. So maybe lower disease incidence, um, mm -hmm. in that regard. Pest, I mean, if you had a, a large part of the garden covered, then it's, it's possible that insects that, you know, had overwintered in the soil wouldn't mm -hmm. be able to emerge. That, that's possible. But a lot of the insects go to the edges of the garden where there's more protection. So hard to know. Great. All right. And then two more that we had left over from before. With all the cucurbit diseases, is there any hope to manage it once it's on the plant? Um, so it was mentioned that some of the fungus diseases blow in. Can it accidentally be transferred from the bed soil or trellis equipment used from previous years? Yeah, um, it depends on the specific pathogen, but most of them will either be, you know, can be transmitted on seed Mm -hmm. They can, some of them can overwinter on tools, on trellises, uh, certainly in the soil. That's the most important thing that we can control is getting the debris out, everything cleaned up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and seed companies are all different in terms of how they deal with 
um, diseases. Um, some will sell certified seed, so it actually has to be tested for pathogens. Others do in-house testing in their own labs. And this is a good point because I think there's some real advantages to buying seed from a company that serves both commercial and home garden audiences because they're really be up on making sure that their seed is as pathogen free as possible because of that commercial clientele. Yeah, got it. Okay. Uh, do you recommend using shade cloth for tomatoes in our area? Uh, I would say it's worth trying if you've had problems with sun burning, with blossoms dropping when it doesn't seem like it was caused by, you know, gray mold, botrytis, or some other disease. If you feel like increasing temperatures are becoming a problem, then I would definitely try it. It's being trialed in Delaware and Maryland, and I think there was great, the, the results were more impressive with pepper, with bell pepper than with tomato. But I think there's going to continue to be a lot of trialing of shade cloth. See, for, for commercial growers, they're out in open fields. And even though they, they're not experiencing the urban heat sink effect, they also don't have any surrounding buildings or trees that are providing some shade at some part of the day, you know, for their plants. So mm -hmm. actually, I haven't seen the negative effects of heat stress on tomatoes and gardens uh, as it's being reported, you know, from farm fields. But certainly shade cloth, I, I would give it a try if you think you've been having issues with the high heat. Awesome. Any advice on growing figs? Um, and there have some specific comments. They have two fig trees about four years old planted in the ground. They're in a protected area but they haven't had any figs yet. And do you know if or when they might get figs and are there male and female fig trees? They're not sure what variety they have as they were a gift, but they do appear to be healthy. Yeah, well, if you can find out the variety, that would be helpful. If you can't, you know, hopefully it, it is a variety that'll grow well in Maryland and produce fruits before the end of the season. There are not separate male and female trees. Um, I, I would say with a decent sized plant, you, you really should start seeing figs forming as long as the plant's not being killed back to the ground. If it's being killed by cold weather and then it's just reemerging, new shoots are coming back out, mm -hmm. then the tree doesn't have time to produce figs. I mean, you should still see little figs, but they probably won't ripen and the tree should be in as full sun a location as possible. Great. Thank you. Okay, and just about on time, that was our last question. Q&A, well done, John. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording. All right, John, you're ready to go. Great. Okay, folks, I thought it'd be fun to just look at some photos um, of, of plant problems. So these are things, uh, problems that have been submitted by clients and it'll just give us a chance to try to figure out what's going on with a particular plant and um, apply some of our diagnostic tools. And um, so let's start with a wilted pepper plant. And interestingly, it looks like it's um, growing on some mounded soil. It's, it's bare soil. Um, and there are other pepper plants that are not affected, but this plant is wilting. So of course, we wonder about watering. No, plants have been watered, plenty of rainfall. And as we get some more photos, we see that the bottom of the stem, the main stem is darkened. It's a little hard to see here. And we see this white growth, this white stuff growing on the stem. And that's the mycelium of uh, southern blight, which is a pretty significant warm season disease, wide host range, a lot of plants are affected, a lot of vegetable crops, but tomato and pepper in particular are the, the plants that we hear most about. And one of the uh, signs that bacterial, uh, that southern blight is at play, we can see these um, structures, these fungal structures called sclerotia that help 
the fungus um, overwinter and survive and reinfect. They look like little tan, tiny um, balls or seeds, and they're attached uh, to the stem where the mycelium are growing. So not much you can really do other than pull the plants out, get rid of them, work organic matter into the soil, um, rotate plants. There, there are no resistant cultivars. It's not something you would typically see year after year um, in a garden, but it can be significant um, for the plants that are affected. Okay, so client sends you photos and they're pretty concerned because this is the pumpkin that's, uh, the pumpkin plant that's gonna produce pumpkins for Halloween for the kids. And they're noticing this lighter uh, coloration in their leaves. It's not in all the leaves, but they're getting worried. And then, oh my gosh, they looked at the other end of the plant and there are all these holes in the leaves. So this is where it's really important, um, whether you're, you're providing services as a master gardener for a client or you're an individual gardener, um, you know, to think about, which is how significant are the symptoms I'm seeing in relation to the overall health of the plant. So when we step back, we can see that this plant looks pretty healthy. And in fact, there are a lot of possible reasons why some leaves may have some discoloration um, of various types. It could be splotches, it could be look like um, intervenal chlorosis, it could be uh, yellowing or browning along the edge, whatever it is, there, there can be a lot of reasons that aren't indicative of any kind of a serious problem. And the same thing with these holes in the leaves, right? There are insects out there doing what they're supposed to be doing if they're plant feeders, which is get nourishment. And that may be from your pumpkin plants. So there are a wide range. This is probably beetle feeding, but it could be caterpillar. You know, um, it's a little ragged. We don't know. We can look and try to figure it out. But ultimately, is it really affecting the overall health of the plants? No, not a problem. So we can move on. But it really is good to try to help um, learn what, of course, which are the serious problems we need to be concerned about and we need to try to prevent and just accept the fact we're going to see all kinds of interesting things and uh, symptoms in the garden that are of no consequence. And we can just note them or appreciate them, but not get worried or stressed out about them. Minor issues, plants in good shape. Oh my gosh, um, you know, we love zucchini and we picked these plants that had all this jelly-like stuff on it. And, you know, we're thinking there might be insect eggs, what's going on? And this is another one of those kind of not real typical symptoms we might see, but not that unusual. And it's just plant sap that's been pushed out of the, out of the zucchini fruit, probably because maybe it's been a, a cloudy day and um, water is not being transpired out of the plant as rapidly as it's being pulled up. Um, for whatever reason, um, the plant has got excess moisture that it has to get rid of and that's gonna be through the fruit in this case, it's perfectly fine to eat and may not see that problem again. So here we've got, um, <clears throat> let's see if I can move this. We've got tomato plant that looks like it's got some problems. And actually I got these photos from Jerry Brust, our IPM vegetable specialist. And um, it's a problem he sees in commercial fields more frequently in recent years. And, you know, you can read here the plants yellowing, the hollow seems uh, hollow. It, it just broke in half um, when the person was investigating, got all these lesions on the uh, stems and all these adventitious roots trying to grow from the stems. So actually this is a significant um, disease, bacterial disease called tomato pith necrosis. I think we're starting to pick it up a little bit um, in, in vegetable gardens. I think I may have had um, a plant succumb to it 
possibly I, did, I didn't send it to the lab so I don't know but um, it seems that it's associated with um, coolish weather um, in the spring early planted tomatoes high nitrogen fertilization it's it's um, caused by three different bacteria that um, are soil borne and it's the kind of thing you may only see in one plant you may only see it one year um, it's hard to tell but I don't I don't think it's going to become a significant problem but it will cause wilting and lower leaves in fact I was reading that it can actually cause minor symptoms and then the symptoms kind of resolve. Uh, it, the, the disease does not progress. So it doesn't mean your plants are goner the way it, it is almost always with fusarium wilt. So that's another one. Here's a real cool looking design. Um, and I've never really seen this on potato foliage. And I think a lot of you will recognize this pattern. It's, it's pretty um, unique and um, we see, uh, I'll give you a hint, we'll see this on a wide variety of plants, herbs, perennials, some vegetables, and it's four line plant bug injury. And it's just the way they feed, uh, the way they move along the plant surface. These are bugs, so they're inserting their, their mouth parts into the cells and removing the contents, not a big deal. You know, it's, uh, they come, they go, and the damage is, is very minor. No need to, to take any kind of action. So um, experienced gardener is concerned because this doesn't look like some of the other foliar diseases that they are familiar with. And they're seeing these little pimply bumps on the fruits. And when we um, sent this to the lab, we found that it was bacterial spot, which is that same disease that does get on pepper. Um, and it's caused by four different species of this Xanthomonas bacteria. And um, it's not that common in home gardens, but you may see it. Um, and it, it can be controlled with copper. So if you see it early, that would be um, a possible way to, to address it, bacterial spot. So this gardener saw some bugs. We don't know what kind of bugs uh, on these bean plants. And then because of that, they sprayed insecticidal soap to kill the bugs. And then not long after that, they're seeing all these significant symptoms on the leaves. And, you know, is this Mexican bean beetle feeding? Is it a disease? I mean, it's the upper surface and then the lower surface. It really doesn't look pathogenic though, does it? It doesn't look like um, some of the typical fungal or bacterial pathogens that we might see. So what we can tell pretty quickly because we've been doing this for a while is this is just a burn. This is phytotoxicity. So insecticidal soap can burn leaves. Also bean leaves are so easily affected by temperatures and what they're leaning up against. Um, you'll see them change colors and show different um, spotting on the leaves. It's inconsequential, uh, but here they, they were burned pretty significantly. And of course, the plant will grow out of this. It's not going to kill the plant, but it shows you that you can injure plants even with organic pesticides. Um, so getting back to expectations, this client um, was seeing problems on these dinosaur kale plants, Tuscan kale or lacinato kale, great plant. I mean, it'll grow through, you know, our summers. I mean, I see it all the time in gardens throughout most of the summer. It's really a fabulous kale, but uh, they, were, they were concerned about the lower leaves yellowing. And I don't know if you can see the holes in some of the leaves. There are holes that were made by caterpillars. Again, when we look at the overall health of the plant, I think any of us would be happy to have this plant in our garden, but it's easy to, you know, if you're fairly new to this, or maybe you haven't developed a more holistic perspective and haven't 
you know, and had seen a lot of problems, you may get concerned about this and a little stressed out. And um, so clearly these are minor problems. The leaf yellowing is natural. That's what older leaves do, especially on annual vegetable plants and the caterpillar feeding is, you know, totally inconsequential. So we'll just move on. And then finally, along these same lines, and it's beans again, uh, looks like pretty significant feeding. Well, research uh, shows us that we can have 20% defoliation. So every individual leaf could be missing 20% of itself, or overall, we could have 20% you know, of the foliage no longer intact and we can produce a full crop. So the plant can handle this. And there are lots of beetles that will feed on um, bean plants, you know, oriental beetle, Asiatic garden beetle. This is a bean leaf beetle. Slugs will feed on bean plants. We don't need to worry too much. Um, they're they're going to be fine. OK, so I think this is going into the chat because we're going to transition now over to the live samples, and it'll just take me a minute to do that. But I think um, Rhea and the staff are putting this survey yep. link. Yeah, great, thank you all. Mm -hmm. And there's somebody chewing on some lacinato kale. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and um, move the operation. And when I come back, we'll look at uh, live samples. All right, sounds good, thanks, John. Um, so here's uh, basil downy mildew, um, and we can see the top side of the leaf is looking kind of off color. They may start yellowing. And then when we flip it over, we can see sporulation. We can actually see it looks fuzzy, kind of grayish purplish fuzz. And at that point, you can remove these symptomatic leaves. New growth will quickly become infected. So it, the, really, the plants are just not going to do very well. The, um, the trick is to, to get resistant varieties. Now, here's an eggplant leaf. An eggplant, of course, gets a uh, flea beetle early in the season. But this is the symptom we've been talking about today with these bugs um, that, you know, enter the, the leaf with their piercing mouth parts and they suck out cell content. So these little tiny dots are called stipples. Maybe I can even. And in this case, it's a lace bug. And I looked and they, they all had dropped off the back of it. But there's a small, very delicate looking lace bug. Um, you can't even really see fecal pellets. This is pretty minor feeding, but there is a lace bug that um, gets on eggplant. Usually it's not, not very significant. And this, of course, is what, you know, flea beetle injury. We didn't really talk about flea beetles. But, you know, you can see through the leaf. Um, when this injury happens early in the growing season, eggplants will not grow well at all. And so protecting them is really super important. Okay, we're gonna move on to the broccoli family. And I wanted to show you um, first, I have to pull this one tight. So here are, this is the egg mass right here of the harlequin bug. So quite small and you can see those yeah, if I hold it like that, that pattern, that uh, black and white pattern, they look like little tiny barrels. So they're gonna be on the undersides of the leaves and stems. Here's that stippling injury, um, you know, throughout. And the more feeding that occurs, the more those stipples coalesce and you get this tattered look and holes in the leaves and, um, it's, it's a huge problem. So this is an insect that's got to be controlled early in the season. Let's see. I think I've got some actual bugs in here. 
Yeah, so there's the harlequin bug, the adult. Look. He's waking up. I've had them uh, in the fridge. So you can see the harlequin bug up close. That's the adult. Very attractive, uh, easy to hand pick. And they are stink bugs, so they smell when you squish them. Let's see, I think we'll move on to some uh, tomato. So I went to a local community garden and was able to get all these great samples. And this is a community garden that had a lot of problems with squash bug and Harlequin bug, and then they went to row covers and they have many fewer problems. Now here's the class, these are the classical symptoms of septoria leaf spot. You can see there's small round lesions, um, but we also have some uh, early blight as well. So the larger lesion right here with the yellow halo, that's early blight. So they do co-occur. Um, but this is really, um, you know, pretty classic for septoria leaf spot. Starts on the lower leaves and then we'll move on up. Here's um, the early blight lesion. You know, it's larger, it's irregular, and also with the, with the yellow halo. I just wanted to also share this leaf. And this is the kind of symptom that can really alarm people. And if you've been growing tomatoes for a while, you know, you, you've seen this, right? And sometimes you may see it more in heirloom varieties. And there's no real, I don't have an explanation because this isn't occurring on all the leaves. It's not really intervenal chlorosis. It's not a magnesium deficiency or anything like that. It's just, it, you'll see it on older leaves and it's a breakdown of chlorophyll in the leaf. Uh, so rather than this more, um, oh, I don't know, consistent yellowing um, across the entire leaf, you'll get this pattern, but it's not a virus, it's not a disease. It's just a natural phenomenon. Okay, move over to the squash. Um, so a couple of things that are interesting. Uh, one, this is, of course, powdery mildew on squash, and um, you know it's it's fairly significant, but not necessarily going to cause a reduction in um, yield. Here's a symptom that's a little more distinctive. Um, and th this is a virus of some sort. There are many viruses. And in community gardens, you'll often see more than one. There are a lot of people growing a lot of squashes and cucumbers, and there are gonna be a lot of insect pests feeding on those plants, transmitting diseases. Um, We'll see symptoms on fruits, and I didn't see any yesterday, but um, this is something to be aware of. You know, viruses are systemic, and in, in many cases, the plants aren't going to produce well. They'll be stunted, or the fruits will uh, be inedible because of um, how they're growing, um, and so they just need to be pulled out. So that's a virus. Now, here's another interesting bit of coloration on a, on a zucchini leaf surface. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. I wish I had the whole leaf, but this probably gives you a sense of what it looks like. Um, this is just natural coloration. A lot of zucchini varieties have this cool silvering pattern on the leaves, but people often think that, you know, they've got a disease problem. No, no problem. And then we, we did, um, I did come across a lot of uh, 
I'm just going to throw this this guy on here. So this is one of the squash bug nymphs, uh, maybe the third instar. And of course, he's awakened, so moving around pretty quickly. So they will aggregate. You'll see pretty large populations on leaves. Um, it's, so it's just so much easier to manage this pest if you can catch it at the egg stage. And these are the eggs. Notice this is the upper leaf surface and all the books will tell you they're laid on the undersides of the leaves, but they're gonna be laid anywhere on the plant, including right on the fruits, right on blossoms, stems, it doesn't matter. But um, if you can just get in the habit of searching for these egg masses, you can find them and then uh, remove them. Okay, we'll let that nymph walk around. And this is probably anthracnose. It's widespread in the garden that I visited. And you can see on this leaf, it's much more advanced so that we've got um, the middles of the lesions drying out and dropping out. And so sometimes people will think, you know, there's an insect, um, involved, but no, it's just the disease, probably anthracnose. And of course, the only way we would know for sure um, is to have it tested. And these, here's something kind of interesting. Um, at first I thought these were anthracnose lesions on the leaf. So this is a large squash and the centers have dropped out, but then I noticed there are these yellow um, insects. And if you remember what the Mexican bean beetle larvae look like, you'll think that that's what we're looking at. But these are a little bit larger. And this is actually squash beetle. So these are the larvae of squash beetles. They feed, they do the same kind of window painting injury on the leaves and that's what we've got here. So it's not a disease, but it's uh, feeding by the squash beetle. And, and that, you know, I used to see it more frequently than I, than I have been um, in recent years, but it is out there and, and you may encounter. So it looks a lot like Mexican bean beetle. Even the adults look very similar, but they're a little bit larger. Now, I don't know if you can see, see if I can get this to focus. There's the first instar. So that's a squash bug, not a squash beetle. That looks like the first uh, instar uh, with the black legs and the green body. Yeah, and actually here are some more eggs on the leaf underside. And right on the other side of that leaf vein is a uh, nymph. Okay, that's, that's the squash, let's see. Oh yeah, and then I think the last thing I've got to show you folks are uh, beans. So just some examples um, of leaf, leaf abnormalities, if you will, or I wouldn't even call it injuries, but here are four different leaves. And I'll, I'll, I don't know if you can see them all that well, I may hold some of them up. So we've got what looks like classic phytotoxicity or burning. So this is all out of one little patch of snap beans in my garden. And the plants are really healthy. They're producing. Some of this is probably leaf hopper feeding uh, on top of the leaf. But a lot of this is probably just um, environmental. It, it may be there may be some nutritional components, but it doesn't, that wouldn't really make sense because I just see it on sporadic leaves. Uh, if we saw it on all the leaves, we might suspect there's some nutritional imbalance. So it's just weird, but it, it, it's the nature of bean leaves. They're very sensitive to very slight changes in their environment. And uh, really the, those symptoms are of no concern, not a problem.
And this is even you know, another uh, more leaves that look symptomatic, look like they may have a disease, but there's no disease. It's just something, something happened at a given time uh, of day that caused that symptom. And then on to the bean beetles. Um, I just want to show you how, you know, what significant feeding looks like. You know, the, the uh, bean beetle adults and larvae can cause that window painting effect where, you know, the leaves look very uh, lace-like and that injury will just get progressively worse until we see large sections of the leaves missing. And here are the bean beetle larvae. So very similar to the uh, squash beetles. They're yellow, they're bristly. So we just don't want to see things get to this point. And that's why since there are two to three generations of this particular pest, catching it early is really important. If you have a big infestation on your first bean crop, it'd be wise to pull the plants out as you know, was described before in a uh, destructive harvest. Another little trick you can try is actually planting a trap crop early in the spring to try to draw the adult beetles that had overwintered to a small number of plants where you know, they'll be glomming on, starting to feed. And at some point you can actually just capture all those beetles to uh, try to interrupt their life cycle. Hey, John, if it's okay, can I just ask a couple questions? That yeah, I think not... it's, uh, that's it for the uh, samples. Oh, nice. So, yeah, I'll switch my camera. Okay, great. That was really cool. <laughs> okay, excellent. So I want to get these two from the chat so I don't forget them. Uh, the first one is, can gene bugs also eat the bean leaves? Has somebody seen them doing that? They're just I, I haven't seen it. They can feed on the roots of plants. I mean, Japanese beetles, of course, would. And um, I would say, yeah, I, I haven't seen it, but I don't see why they couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and then when is the, lead, the last generation of bean beetles in Maryland? Oh, boy. You know, here's the way to look at it. There are two to three generations and they're overlapping. So you may see adults and larvae late, you know, I mean, in September. Um, so there's really no way to get around them because they are overlapping each generation. So it's not like you can find a space in the timeline to plant when you won't, won't have the problem. Right. Um, is there a rule of thumb regarding how to dispose of insect versus diseased or damaged plants? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, we were having a discussion the other day about all the yard waste that goes, um, get, gets picked up in different counties in Maryland and jurisdictions and it gets composted. And people wonder, well, if I put something that's really highly pathogenic in there, will the composting process kill it? And that's a really good question. And so there's no simple answer other than if you're going to compost, you want that pile to get up to 140 degrees. If it gets up to 140 for three days in a row, then, and, and all parts of the pile have reached that temperature, then you can be pretty well assured you'll, you'll be killing weed seeds, mm -hmm. pathogens, and insect pests. Yeah. You know, farmers sometimes will plow under, disc under uh, diseased plants to just chop them up as small as possible so they'll decompose as quickly as possible in the soil. But, you know, we're trying to get people away from tilling and so forth. So, you know, composting at home is fine as long as you can really maintain uh, those high temperatures. 
Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So that was all from the chat. We'll move into the Q and A. In the meantime, um, I know that folks are kind of hopping off as we reach the end of our presentation. So I did want to say thank you for joining us, but also let you know that I have launched a demographics poll, if you wouldn't mind filling that out before you leave. So it is anonymous and it is also optional, but it really does help us to report our information to USDA and NIFA to show them that we are working on our programming. All right, so the next question is, does copper control only fungal diseases or is yeah. it also helpful for bacterial yeah, diseases? Yeah, bacter bacterial diseases too, yes. And what about those caused by water molds? Well, those are typically gonna be um, soil borne. And so we wouldn't be drenching with copper. So with water molds, the, the key is don't plant in wet areas. And um, if it's occurring while you're growing transplants, just try to not overwater and you know prevent the problem. Mm -hmm. And that that's where those biologicals come in. That's where people like commercial growers would be incorporating some of those biological fungicides into their growing mixes or even applying it to the soil. Got so it. That would be more effective there. Okay, the next one's about spotted lanternfly. Um, they have a friend in Harford County and they said spotted lanternfly destroyed his zucchini plant and they were thinking spotted lanternfly only attacked fruit and they weren't sure if they would be invading our gardens. So people have observed spotted lanternfly on a lot of different plants, including some vegetables. If there was, if any feeding has been observed up to this point on vegetable crops, it seems real incidental, meaning there's been a huge population of spotted lanternfly in an area. And just because there's not enough for everybody to get mm -hmm. on their favorite plants, they may have ended up on some vegetable plants and maybe done some feeding. But the, the friend, if we could get photos of that, that would be great because that's not really been reported yet. Um, spotted lanternfly, you know, feeding heavily on plants, but you know, it could be happening. So we'd love to get some photos of that if possible. So Joy, if you're still with us and you're able to reach out to your friend and they have photos, that would be great. We'd love to see them. Okay, so that's actually all the Q&A that we had. Chat's looking pretty good too. So I think we're all set. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you so much to everybody for joining us. I'm gonna stop the recording at this point.